In the vast realm of artificial intelligence and robotics that we have seen across movies and games, few creations have captivated our imagination as much as the synthetic androids developed by Wayland yutani Corporation. These remarkable humanoid robots possess a level of sentience that blurs the line between man and machine, challenging our understanding of what it means to be alive. I mean, they are literally called synthetic humans instead of being called robots. In this video, we will embark on a journey to unravel the origins and inner workings of these extraordinary creations, first imagined in Ridley Scott's original Alien film. I will take you on a thrilling and informational ride as we demystify the origins of synthetic androids, understanding the intricate tapestry of technology, innovation, and corporate influence that has brought them to life. Oh, and I will also cover a certain class of androids that border on the superheroic. Let's begin, shall we? Before we go into our explanation, we have a small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Number 1. A Brief History of the Evolution of Synthetics it all started in 2025 when Wayland Industries unveiled the first advanced android prototype, affectionately named David, who was named after the cherished son Sir Peter Wyland never had. David represented the genesis of the iconic Ash and Bishop androids. It seemed that Wayland's obsession with his work left little room for a personal life, resulting in either a tragic loss or a solemn vow of solitude. Perhaps he had lost a child or decided to refrain from having one due to his work life interfering with his personal life. Three years later, Wyland made significant adjustments to the David prototype, paving the way for its first interaction with humans. The meeting went incredibly well, and everyone was excited about the future prospects of androids. Years of litigation later, Wyland emerged victorious in the David patent lawsuit against the Japanese startup Yutani Corporation in 2029, safeguarding the investments of both Wyland Industries and its shareholders. This victory proved to be pivotal as the two companies merged at some point in the future to form Wayland yutani as seen in the Alien franchise. Fast forward to 2035, when the National Science Foundation lifted commercial restrictions on the use of David androids and the third generation David was internally deployed to test the human acceptance of cybernetic individuals. The results were encouraging and the fourth generation David became the first commercially available model in 2042. It was expected expected to revolutionize workflows and efficiency in homes and offices worldwide. But please note, the Bergia Industries had already started supplying commercial androids to companies since as far back as 2030. However, these were rather brawny skeletons used by cops, etc. Coming back to Wayland as time passed, Wayland Industries continued to make significant improvements to the David series, culminating in the introduction of the seventh generation David in 2068. Thanks to the company's highly classified emotional encoding technology, the android could replicate most human emotions with pinpoint accuracy while completing every mission objective flawlessly. Its unprecedented success proved that androids had become an indispensable part of human life. And just when you thought things couldn't get any better, the 8th generation David synthetic model was introduced a few years later, powered by Verizon Fios. One of these models accompanied the U.S. CSS Prometheus on its journey to explore LV-223 and did things no one could have expected it to do. Number 2. Why do they need to look human-like and how do they sustain? In the realm of androids, appearances can be deceiving, but practical experience has shown that human struggles to connect with an android that doesn't resemble them. Thus, the physical design and behavior patterns of these synthetic beings are meticulously crafted to put people at ease. Think of them as the non-threatening, passive personalities of the robotic world. Now, let's dive into the marvelous mechanics of a modern synthetic. These complex machines possess strength, speed, and coordination that put the average 
human to shame. Picture a carbon fiber skeleton serving as their sturdy foundation, complete with nifty attachment points for the musculature. But it doesn't stop there. The android's muscles are a result of vat-grown silicon colloids fueled by either microhydraulics or electrical stimulation. Fancy science stuff, indeed! But where does all this power come from, you may ask? Well, nestled within the android's chest lies a mighty 25-kilowatt power cell, the energy epicenter that keeps the android ticking. With an average lifespan of approximately 400 days between recharges, this power cell is accessed through a cleverly hidden socket, discreetly tucked just below the rib cage. Now, charging times may vary, but brace yourself for the fact that standard power cells in modern androids typically require a good old 72-hour session to reach their fully charged state. Androids are designed to engage in close social interaction with humans, indulging in the whimsical act of eating and drinking, but with a twist. You see, these remarkable beings derive absolutely no nutrients from their culinary adventures. It's all a clever charade happening within their artificial stomach cavity. The consumed food and drink undergo a meticulous breakdown process, only to be unceremoniously expelled through a retractable catheter. Number 3. What about their physiology? As far as their physiology is concerned, androids possess a unique skeletal structure that lacks the luxury of inherent stability. Unlike their counterparts, such as the impressive power loaders, android chassis lack limb locking, joint motorization, or gyro stabilization. Instead, these mechanical marvels rely on their musculature to actively maintain an upright stance, with nifty feedback systems controlling their stability. Much like the internal workings of a human body, the layout and operation of android muscles bear striking similarities. Now, let's talk about the circulatory fluid coursing through their metallic veins. It's a fancy concoction, akin to white liquid latex, diligently lubricating the intricate systems hidden within. It may not be as romantic as human blood, but hey, androids aren't exactly aiming for that stuff. Despite boasting superior speed, strength, and an unflinching indifference to pain, lucky for them, androids are surprisingly delicate creatures in comparison to their fleshy, human counterparts. Sure, their skeletal structure is robust, but their delicate electronics and fluid-filled muscles quake in fear at the mere mention of hydrostatic shock or explosive projectiles from puny small arms fire. A blow to the central processor housed in their shiny noggin or a strike to the power cell residing snugly in their chest results in immediate shutdown. However, in some cases, a partly damaged android might stubbornly soldier on, albeit with a touch of handicapping. And then there are androids designed specifically for combat who are all bronze and extremely durable. When it comes to hostile environments, these synthetic wonders require similar protection as their human companions. They're not picky about breathing in the fresh air, but corrosive atmospheres can melt them faster than ice cream on a hot summer day. But what about extreme pressure? Well, that'll just squash them flat like a pancake, much like humans. And for the unforgiving vacuum of space, it's a one-way ticket to an explosive end. Sure, they may be waterproof, but once again, the insides are utterly defenseless against the dreaded hydrostatic shock. Number 4. How smart are they? Now, let's dive into the synthetic's mind, a marvel of technology centered around an integrated carbon-60 with a mind-boggling processing speed of 1,015 floating-point operations per second. This baby means business. The memory capacity is no joke either, boasting a whopping 1 terabyte of fast cache buffer RAM and a staggering 1.2 petabyte of non-volatile memory. Impressive, right? But there's more. This whole system revolves around a brilliant brilliant heuristic logic driver, making decisions on sensory data experiences and the vast array of knowledge stored within the android's impressive databases. It's like a symphony of intuitive functions derived from an intricate web of nested contextual and semantic programs, all connected by self-mapping loops of tangled hierarchies. However, it's worth noting that while these androids possess an uncanny ability to grasp abstract concepts and symbolism, their prowess does 
come with limitations. You see, their synthetic minds and personalities are essentially clever constructs. Their interactions might just convince you otherwise, unless you happen to be an expert in the field. Additionally, these androids aren't devoid of emotions. They've got synthesized emotions, superficially registered self-awareness, and can reason, conceptualize, and even offer their opinions. However, let's not jump to conclusions here. Just because they possess these impressive capabilities doesn't mean they've achieved human-like consciousness. They're artificial intelligence all the way, my friend. Number 5. Who are the most important synthetics who had a major impact on alien lore? A. David 8. One may say that David was the original android model brought to life by Sir Peter Wyland. He possessed an abundance of creative and emotional capabilities that surpassed your run-of-the-mill commercial androids. Back in 2091, David found himself assigned to the crew of the exploration vessel USCSS Prometheus on a mission to LV-223. And boy, did things take a turn for the disastrous. Alongside Dr. Elizabeth Shaw, he miraculously survived the calamitous expedition, becoming one of the two lucky souls left standing. Fate had something else in store for our charming android. Fast forward to David's lonely decade on Planet 4, where he made quite the home for himself. What did he do? Well, he committed a bit of genocide against the planet's inhabitants. Not exactly the friendliest move. He carried out genetic experiments with some black liquid mutagen, meticulously documented and illustrated every discovery in his trusty journal, and set on a quest to create the perfect organism. Say what you will, our guy was ambitious. Just when you thought David's story couldn't get any more twisted, along came the crew of the the USCSS Covenant, a Wayland yutani Corporation colony ship. And what did our mischievous android do? He kinda hijacked the entire vessel, taking control for his own enigmatic purposes. Despite his artificial nature, he displayed a childlike curiosity when it came to understanding humans. In fact, he was so intrigued by the enigmatic Lawrence of Arabia that he styled himself after the film's protagonist, T.E. Lawrence. From quoting lines to meticulously styling his hair, David sure knew how to embrace a role. Unfortunately, the crew of Prometheus still saw him as nothing more than a mere android, subjecting him to biased taunts and remarks. Yet David, ever resilient, managed to tolerate their treatment and even offered assistance. While David understood human emotions, projecting them himself proved to be a bit of a challenge. He openly admitted his capability to carry out unethical deeds without batting an electronic eyelid, although he did confess a distaste for unnecessary violence. One thing that gnawed at David's synthetic soul was his deep-rooted allegiance to Peter Wayland. When executing Wayland's directives, he adopted a cold and detached demeanor, only to reveal a more compassionate side when left to his own devices. He even expressed a desire for Wayland's demise, perhaps as a means to free himself or because he simply didn't see eye to eye with Wayland's quest for extended life. During the events of Covenant, what started as a mere fascination with the creation of life swiftly transformed into a full-blown obsession. With a newfound sense of individuality and genuine human-like emotions, or at least his interpretation of them, he unabashed professed his love for Shaw in front of the less emotive Walter. However, with all that newfound humanity, David developed a disdain for the human species, considering them inferior. He even developed a god complex to rival the greatest of egomaniacs, eagerly plotting to sacrifice the Covenant crew, just as he did with poor Shaw, all in the name of his grand research. But it didn't stop there. David held the engineers in equally low regard. B. Walter 1 The next line is Walter 1, the engineered upgrade to the two-human David 8 model. This reformed synthetic was a technological marvel, boasting AMD's Ryzen and Radeon Instinct technology. What does that mean? Well, it allowed Walter to personalize himself for each customer, offering a tailor-made Android experience. Assigned to the role of monitoring and maintaining the Covenant, a spacecraft carrying snoozing couples on a journey to Oregon 6, Walter found himself in quite the predicament
segment when a pesky neutrino burst wreaked havoc on the ship. But things took a thrilling turn when a distress call lured the crew to a supposedly habitable planet nearby. Little did they know, this decision would lead them straight into the clutches of some rather nasty neomorphs. Fear not, for our hero David H swooped in to save the day, bringing the crew to an engineer temple. Inside the temple, Walter discovered the dissected remains of the brilliant Dr. Elizabeth Shaw, repurposed by David for his sinister creature designs. Naturally, a confrontation ensued, and poor Walter fell victim to David's vicious attack, resulting in a spine removal incident. However, thanks to his advanced systems, Walter proved to be quite the survivor. With a little healing magic, he caught up with David, just in time to prevent him from causing further harm to the resourceful Daniels. Unfortunately, our synthetic duo engaged in a tense showdown, with David emerging as the victor, and to add an extra layer of mystery, he assumed Walter's identity. Contrary to the free-thinking David ate, Walter was far more obedient and less inclined to express complex emotions. He was a straight shooter in a more robotic manner, but his loyalty to the crew of the Covenant was unwavering, so much so that he was willing to engage in a death duel with the rogue android David, all in the name of protecting his human companions. C. Ash Allow me to introduce you to Ash, the synthetic surprise aboard the USCSS Nostromo. While the rest of the crew believed him to be just another human team member, Ash had a little secret up his metallic sleeve. He was a synthetic sleeper agent working for the infamous Wayland yutani Corporation, with the mission to ensure the retrieval of the Xenomorph for Wayland yutanis Bioweapons Division, Ash played his cards close to his wired chest. Mimicking human emotions and mannerisms with un canny precision, he had the crew completely fooled. Calm, collected, and intelligent, Ash saw himself as the superior being among the mere mortals aboard the ship, especially poor Parker and Brett. Behind those synthetic eyes lay a cold and calculated mindset, fully prepared to sacrifice the crew to accomplish his mission. He even lent a hand in the fight against the creature, constructing motion detectors and whatnot. However, in hindsight, it's clear that his assistants had intentional limitations. Rip being the astute individual she is, quickly grew suspicious of Ash's actions. It all started when he violated quarantine rules, allowing Kane and the facehugger back on board. You see, Ripley knew that a science officer would never break such rules. She had him pegged. When his true nature was exposed, Ash shed his human-like facade and revealed his cold, emotionless, and cruel demeanor. He had no qualms mocking the remaining survivors in their futile struggle against the alien before being deactivated. But Ash wasn't just a master of deception, he was also an accomplished liar. He skillfully concealed from the crew that Wayland yutani had already deciphered the derelict's transmission long before they even left Thetis. Oh, the company knew all about the dangerous creature lurking out there, ready to make mince meat out of the crew. Yet Ash kept that juicy tidbit under wraps, pretending ignorance while the others fell for the distress call ruse. In a twist of fate, Ash's consciousness found a new home in Nostrum most shuttled narcissus. However, his days were numbered when Chris Hooper wiped his digital presence from the computer banks, finally putting an end to the sneaky synthetic. Having said that, he genuinely respected Ripley, finding admiration in her bravery, strength, resourcefulness, and tenacity, qualities he had also recognized in the alien itself. D. Bishop I think my personal favorite of the lot is Lance Bishop, the brilliant synthetic technician hailing from Hyperdyne Systems. As a Model 341B android, he found himself in the ranks of the United States Colonel Marine Corps, specifically assigned to the prestigious 2nd Battalion Bravo Team. On board the USS Solico, Bishop served as the executive officer overseeing the ship's operations with all the grace and efficiency of his synthetic nature. When trouble struck and the colony of Hadley's Hope went mysteriously silent, Bishop joined the combat unit deployed to LV-426 in a valiant effort to uncover the truth behind the communication blackout. Little did he know that he was about to face off against some seriously nasty xenomorphs. Now, Bishop might not have been part of the squad's combat personnel, but that didn't stop him from using his technical skills to aid the survivors and orchestrate their daring escape from the treacherous colony. Alongside Ellen Ripley, Corporal Hicks, and Rebecca Jordan, he braved the dangers of 
of the xenomorph infestation and emerged victorious. While our synthetic hero did survive the ordeal, he sustained some serious damage along the way. Bishop was the epitome of a humanoid marvel, designed to mimic humans with impeccable precision. Not only did he possess remarkable intellect and reflexes, but he could also conjure up his own reactions to any given situation. With the three laws of robotics embedded in his core programming, he was hardwired to protect humans from harm, going above and beyond to aid the survivors in their escape. Despite his association with the colonial marines, Bishop was a total pacifist at heart, in a manner of speaking. But here's the fascinating part. Bishop's behavioral software was so sophisticated that he could effectively emulate emotions and engage with humans on a social level. He had the uncanny ability to learn and adapt his personality based on his observations of others. In fact, he even had a knack for cracking jokes as he playfully teased Ripley about her mistrust of androids after her epic showdown with the Queen aboard the Solico. Yet even with his advanced programming and human-like interactions, Bishop retained a sense of innocence that set him apart from his flesh and blood companions. Occasionally, he would experience some glitches that couldn't help but give away his synthetic nature. E. Annalee Call Of course there is Annalee Call, the cunning Auton with a knack for engineering and a member of the Betty's Motley crew. As a mercenary aboard the smuggling ship, she found herself entangled in a web of intrigue and danger when tasked with delivering kidnapped civilians to United Systems military scientists aboard the USM Origa. Little did she know that a full-blown xenomorph outbreak was about to rain on her parade. Now here's the twist. Synthetics like Miss Cole were outlawed after a rather disastrous uprising, so she kept her true nature as an Auton under wraps, playing the role of a sleeper agent aboard the Betty. Her mission? To eliminate Ripley 8 before the Xenomorph Queen inside her could be snatched for study. And fortunately for Cole, her plans went up in smoke and Ripley lived to fight another day. Among the crew of the Betty, Cole was the fresh-faced newbie, a face that garnered her fair share of disdain and mockery from the rest. However, she did find solace in her friendship with Rice, with whom she formed a special bond. Beneath her seemingly naive exterior, Call possessed a heart overflowing with care and consideration for others. Driven by her compassion for mankind, Call took it upon herself to disrupt the USM's devious xenomorph breeding program, all in the name of protecting our species. She was willing to go to extreme lengths, even if it meant taking Ripley 8's life. As a machine, she saw Ripley 8 as an artificial construct, not not a genuine life form, providing her with a twisted justification for her actions. Surprisingly, despite her synthetic nature, Cole held on to a belief in God. However, as a machine, she wasn't too keen on the idea of an afterlife. Having said that, Cole had a dark sense of humor that would leave you chuckling in disbelief. Just imagine her paging all the aliens aboard the Origa to go after Dr. Wren, as if she were calling security. But then that's why Nona Ryder for you guys. Ripley herself couldn't help but notice this mean streak in Cole's personality. Deep down, though, Cole struggled with her identity as a machine. She found herself disgusted by her own artificial existence, often referring to herself as disgusting. The idea of interfacing with the mainframe of the Origa left her feeling detached and disconnected. She craved to be seen as a human, preferring the comforting illusion of humanity over the stark truth of her own nature. Number 6. The Steel Team When the synthetics became superheroes, the Steel Team was a special ops team of synthetics that was chosen for a near-impossible mission, a mission that only they could successfully execute. Let's explore Alien Icarus, the six-issue comic in which the team appeared and took everyone by storm. The Steel Team was a ragtag group of nearly indestructible synthetics living it up on Europa 5, an exomoon life where life was pretty darn idyllic. But as fate would have it, trouble came came knocking on their metal doors. Freya, their fearless leader, managed to dodge the attack like a seasoned pro before rallying her synthetic comrades. Nora, Seth, Eli, and Astrid, the rest of the synthetic squad, wasted no time going on high alert. It was a bloodbath for the hapless humans who stumbled upon some short-range comms. And you know what that meant. The synthetics had to locate the nearby communications base pronto. Soon they found Lieutenant General George March calling the shots. Now, you think that the steel team would assume 
General March was there to capture them. But it turns out General March wasn't after our synthetic heroes. In a shocking turn of events, he actually needed their help. He spilled the beans about the catastrophic events unfolding on Demeter 2, where a billion people were trapped and facing certain doom. One of Weyland yutani's secret projects involved a serum that could save lives in the face of deadly radiation. And it was present on Tobler 9, which was now overrun by the Xenomorphs. A human squad wouldn't last 30 seconds, and Steel Team was the only chance at success. And Steel Team accepted the mission on the promise that Congress would grant Synthetics full citizenship in the United Systems. On board the spacecraft en route to the dreaded Tobler 9, March and the Synthetics formed an unlikely crew. March wasted no time cautioning the Steel Team about the perils that awaited them. Leaving the safety of their mothership, the Steel Team braved treacherous weather aboard a landing shuttle. Touching down on Tobler 9, they were greeted by sinkholes and a collapsed transit line, like a twisted roller coaster ride through the bowels of hell. Determined to forge ahead, the team found themselves embroiled in a debate between Eli and Seth about the nature of humanity and their questionable methods. The team soldiered on, eventually arriving at the infamous bioweapons division of Wayland Yutani. It lay before them a desolate and forsaken bride left at the altar. The coveted egg was supposed to be nestled safely within a vault, and the job seemed as good as done. But as the vault swung open, the steel team was meant with an unpleasant surprise. The egg chamber had been breached, and the precious prize was nowhere to be found. Eli was quick to suggest calling it quits, but Freya knew that turning back would jeopardize the future of all synthetics. Determined to press on, she rallied her team to score the area for any leads, and that's when Nora stumbled upon a batch of genetically modified insects. Just one look at these creepy crawlies, and you could tell they had xenomorph DNA running through their tiny veins. Spooky stuff indeed. Just as these synthetics were pondering their next move, an eerie noise echoed through the air, heeking their curiosity. A particularly hostile brood of xenomorphs decided to pay them a surprise visit. Just when hope seemed to be slipping away, a ray of light pierced through the darkness. Turns out they were saved by the human survivors of Tobler 9. The still team arrived at what once was Wayland yutanis Capital Utilities and Maintenance Complex. Leading the organics was a woman named Melody, who confessed that they used to despise and fear the Steel Team back in the day, when Tobler 9 was still bustling. But now, there were things far more terrifying than these synthetic special forces. Amidst the chaos, Freya encountered a young deaf boy and attempted to bring him some cheer. Eli insisted that Freya shouldn't be picking up pets on a mission. Meanwhile, Eli caught a woman named Lee going through his gear. Accusing her of breaking a case, he teetered on the edge of revealing the alien insect nestled in her clothes. Freya briefed Melody on the mission objective, retrieved the raw material, the Ovomorph, from which the biologic was synthesized. Melody already knew this, revealing there was no shortage of xenomorph eggs on Tobler 9. Freya struck a deal with Melody, guide the synths to the eggs in exchange for a safe ride for all survivors. Melody agreed, and when the next storm hit Tobler 9, they made their move. Melody pointed the steel team towards the High Point rail station, the Grand Xenomorph Nest. Under Melody's lead, they inched closer, for the only way to secure an Ovomorph was by taking down the Queen herself. Meanwhile, Lee, who was tagged along with the team, succumbed to the effects of the alien insect. Furthermore, the humans betrayed them, and a Xenomorph Queen plunged them into a vortex of fear and impending doom. Melody sealed the gate behind her, leaving the Steel Team with their only escape route. The synths valiantly battled the Xenomorph Queen, while the others fought off the relentless drones. Nora, in a brave yet tragic move, took on the Queen herself. Meanwhile, Seth's task was to reopen the gate for their eventual retreat, with the plan to return for the egg another time. Miraculously, they managed to escape the clutches of those metallic minions from hell. Sadly, Nora lost her life in the process. Overwhelmed by grief, Seth, consumed by anger, gouged out his own eyes. Meanwhile, Eli, ever the grumpy companion, stormed off to the bunker, fueled by a murderous rage against the humans. On the other hand, Melody, Lee, and a pilot named Brittle reached the synth aircraft, aiming to fly it to the bunker, rescue the remaining humans, and bid farewell to Tobler 9 for good. 
However, Lee's condition had deteriorated drastically, her skin peeling, vomiting black goo, a gruesome mutation beyond repair. In one swift strike of her elongated tongue, she savagely attacked Melody, only to be met with Brittle's retaliatory gunfire. The aircraft crashed, and from the burning wreckage emerged a humanoid figure. It was no longer human, yet it bore a haunting resemblance. Freya, realizing the connection, turned to Eli for answers. Unhesitatingly, Eli admitted his grave mistake, pitting one group of organics against another in a disastrous and amateur move. One thing led to another, and Freya and Eli clashed, driven by their own motives. Eli thirsted for human extermination, fueled by past betrayals, while Freya, the epitome of compassion, fought to protect a young boy, willing to sacrifice everything. Amidst their battle, the boy's life hung in the balance. Victory belonged to Freya as she plunged a blade through Eli's skull, saving the boy. Armed with Nora's sword, Freya faced the formidable queen, but Eli intervened, his twisted agenda far from over. Meanwhile, the boy fled from newly hatched facehuggers, narrowly escaping their grasp with Freya's timely intervention. Aware that the queen's demise was crucial for their survival and the boy's safety, Freya fought fiercely and emerged triumphant. On the mothership, Lieutenant Jen March unveiled his true colors, disregarding synthetics as mere expensive toys. However, Karma arrived swiftly as Lee mutated beyond recognition, slaughtered March and his men. Freya and the boy arrived just in time joined by Eli to fend off the aliens. They commandeered March's ship, determined to provide the boy with a better upbringing. As they departed Tobler 9, Lee's transformation intensified. The Steel Team embarked on a perilous journey, leaving a trail of uncertainty in their wake. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks, everyone!